Welcome to MedCrime. Today we shall be looking at a surgical informed consent. An informed consent is the process in which a healthcare provider educates a patient about the risks, benefits, and alternatives of a given procedure or an intervention. The patient must be competent enough to make voluntary decisions about whether to undergo the procedure or the intervention or not. Therefore, an informed consent is both an ethical and legal obligation of medical practitioners and originates from the patient's right to direct what happens to their body. This informed consent brings about trust and confidence between the surgeon and the patient and the patient should have the right to decide their own medical destiny, their informed consent, the truth about the procedure, and confidentiality. So in this case, the amount of information given should be enough for a mentally competent person or patient to make an informed choice about a given procedure. The following are the requirements for documentation of the informed consent. Number one is the nature of the procedure. As a surgeon, you need to explain the nature of the procedure to the patient in the simplest possible way. And then you need to explain the risks and benefits of the procedure, the reasonable alternatives to the intervention, and also look at the risks and benefits of those alternatives. And at last, you assess the patient's understanding through each of the elements. In an informed consent, we have some of the components that we need to look at. For example, the first one will be uh, to describe the proposed intervention that will be undertaken. And then we emphasize on the patient's role in decision making. Also discuss the alternatives to the proposed intervention, discussing of the risks of the proposed interventions, and eliciting a patient's preference, usually by the patient's sick. So this one follows a given order whereby at first you need to assess the preconditions, the patient's competence and voluntariness to undergo the procedure. And then you provide the information by just educating the patient on the procedure that they are going to undertake, the recommendations of a care plan and understanding of this information by the patient. And then from there we state the consent. In this case, the patient's consent for the procedure and record this authorization in uh, using a signature and their full legal names. And then there are some of the roles of the surgeon and the patient. So as a patient, you must receive sufficient and accurate information about the nature of the condition, the proposed treatment plan, the treatment options and the prognosis of the outcome. And on the other hand, as a surgeon, the surgeon must explain the procedure, the practical implications and the prognosis or the outcomes of the surgery, the risks and complications of the procedure itself, and some of the risks from other aspects, for example, anesthesia administration, intravenous lines, and other alternatives. And then there's some of the good practices when you are administering or obtaining this Number one, you need to obtain the consent in a suitable surrounding. You need to show empathy with the patient and use the simplest language possible for the patient's level of understanding. Preferably a relative or a friend should be present as you explain to the patient and use probably books or leaflets. Then you need to establish if the patient has really understood what you've told them and do not limit information on the grounds of distress. And uh, once you have obtained this consent, then now you have a consent form. All competent persons who are above the age of 18, which is legal age for most of the countries, should sign this form. And clinician should also sign the form indicating that the patient has been given and understands all the information about the procedure or surgical intervention to be undertaken. And the consent form is not a legal proof that the consent has been given. 
So the legal importance of informed consent is that it protects you against battery, whereby uh, this is the violation of a civil law in which forbids intentionally touching another person without their consent. And also it protects about negligence. Uh, negligence is when the surgeon neglects to tell a patient of potential hazards of the procedure or the surgery. And when we have an unconscious patient, there's some of the moral and legal responsibilities that need to be acted on the best interest of this patient. And there is no adult who can legally consent for the surgery on behalf of another adult. And not even relatives are able to sign the consent forms on behalf of unconscious patients or incompetent patients. So when it comes to children, a consent for elective surgery in young children must always be obtained from a competent adult who is usually the parent to the children. In emergency or life-saving surgery, an adult consent can be overridden by the surgeon's intervention and if a patient chooses to treatment deemed inappropriate, it can be overridden by a court order. This comes in when some of the religions, for example, which do not really want their followers to undergo surgery or procedure like blood transfusion, but yet this is really uh, a treatment that could be life-saving to the patient, but the relatives or the parents of the children could be really against it. So in this case, the court can really override their decision. And adolescents who are under the age of 18 can give a consent without parental consent. And the patient should be encouraged to discuss this with their parents. In life-threatening situations, children who are under 18 do not have the right to refuse treatment. So, what are uh, what of the cases of mental handicap and psychiatric illnesses? So, attempts must be made to obtain a patient's consent when the communication is difficult. In psychiatric patients, when surgery is necessary to protect life or prevent serious disability, treatment can be proceeded provided at the surgeon and the psychiatric team agree on how to move ahead. Mentally handicapped patients must not be able to give informed consent. And the fact remains that no adult can act as a legal proxy for another adult. So the only persons who can make the decision that the surgery is the best interest of the patient are the surgeon in consultation with the carers of this patient. And there are some of the limitations to patients' ability to understand this informed consent, for example, our surgeons need to improve their communication skills. Most surgeons don't really know how to communicate with patients, per se, and we also need to learn how to write down what has been discussed with the patient, what will be done, why the morbidity and the mortality is associated with the surgery or intervention that is to be done, and a written information to the patient. So we need to leave a copy of the consent form. Theme. And if unsure of the patient's understanding, we may be forced to postpone the treatment. And confidentiality is one of the key things that we need to put into consideration. And patients have the right to control access of any information which they give the surgeon for the purpose of treatment, except in the cases of serious crime or highly infections and not viral diseases. And remember, Police have no right to clinical information, which may provide evidence for a crime. And patients have no right to harm others through exercising their right to confidentiality. And when we continue with our confidentiality issue, when the patient is unable to communicate clearly, relatives and friends may have to be consulted. And strong attempts should be made to obtain the patient's permission. Knowledge about the prognosis and treatment should also remain confidential and clinical information should not be given over the phone unless the patient has consented so and the person identified. So sharing clinical information with colleagues is implied with consent. So in conclusion, our patients must have a right to give the informed consent. The surgeon must respect this right and provide high standard of care and surgeons must provide enough information for competent patients to make an informed choice. The expressed documented wishes of competent patients should not be overridden. 
Every effort must be made to ensure that the patient's understanding as well as he or she is capable of. If the patient is capa incapable of choice, if the patient is incapable of choice, the necessity of surgery is the determining factor in this case. Thank you so much.